What if Yoda defeated Palpatine in Revenge of the Sith? What would happen then? Let's find out. So in this alternate timeline, everything would be the same until Yoda and Palpatine take their duel into the Senate chamber. Unlike in the original timeline, here Palpatine would not be able to knock Yoda's saber from his hands. And because of that, Yoda would jump up to Palpatine and block his lightning with his lightsaber instead of his hands. This would go on for a few short moments until Yoda, like in the original timeline, would overpower Palpatine's lightning. Here he would do so by deflecting it all back onto Palpatine. Anyways, following this, without even wasting a second, Yoda's focus would narrow further. His eyes would burn with the lights out of the Force, unwavering in his intent. And then, utilizing the agility that the Force was granting his ancient body, Yoda would relentlessly press his advantage. And at this point, Palpatine, sensing his impending doom, would desperately try to escape, to twist and evade Yoda's relentless barrage of strikes. Yet, Yoda would be successful in cutting off the Emperor's retreat, forcing the corner Sith Lord to scramble for any means of defense. And then, finally, seeing no other option, Palpatine would let out an enraged bellow and attempt to unleash another torrent of Force Lightning, and Palpatine would fail in this attempt. And then, in a final, blinding flash, Yoda would sever Palpatine's connection to the dark side and his connection to his body below the neck, both in one decisive strike with a screen lightsaber. And following this, in front of Grandmaster Yoda, Darth Sidious lay dead, in two pieces. And so, the Emperor's rule, as Yoda had said, was now at an end. But again, like Yoda said, it was not short enough. The damage Sidious did was massive, but Yoda didn't have time to dwell on any of that at the moment. He had to leave before anyone saw him. And so he did, just like in the original timeline, Yoda escaped with the help of Bail Organa. But in this timeline, Yoda had not failed. And it was not to exile that Yoda was planning to go now. And now, turning our attention to Anakin and Mustafar, the events on the lava planet would remain unchanged. Obi-Wan still took the high ground, Anakin still tried it, and as a result, Anakin lost his limbs and was left to burn to death by Obi-Wan. But after that point, things would deviate quite significantly from the original timeline. And the reason for that is Palpatine being too dead to help Anakin here. But even though Palpatine never arrived, Anakin would still try to save himself. Drawing on the immense pain, both mental and physical, that he was feeling, Anakin would crawl up the high ground, eventually making it back to the landing platform where Anakin was hoping that R2 would help him by calling someone for help, perhaps. But when Anakin got there, he found that R2 was not with his ship. And Anakin believed that the droid 2 had betrayed him. Anakin's anger flared, but there wasn't much he could do. Anakin then directed his gaze towards the skies of Mustafar, and its swirling dark clouds were the last thing that Anakin Skywalker so in his life. In the meantime, Obi-Wan and Yoda had arrived back at Polis Massa, with Padme also being cared for on the asteroid. Yoda had many important things to discuss with Obi-Wan, Bale, and Padme when she recovered, but Yoda had to wait because, no long after being brought to the medical facility on Polis Massa, Padme went into labor. So massive side note here, the actual reason for Padme's death is not something that has a concrete answer. I have my own theories on what happened, but for this video, I will be going with the most popular belief that Palpatine transferred Padme's life force into Anakin. And if we were to go by that line of thinking, since both Palpatine and Anakin are dead in this timeline, Padme should live on, and so here, she does. So after Luke and Leia are born, and Padme is feeling good enough to talk, Master Yoda would detail everything to the two senators, Padme and Bail. He would tell them of how Palpatine was his Sith who orchestrated the Clone Wars to destroy the Jedi, and how the clones were programmed to betray the Jedi, and also of what Anakin Skywalker did. After hearing all this, Padme would be shocked, rightfully so, but eventually she would come to believe that Anakin was just another victim of Palpatine's manipulations. And while she knew that Obi-Wan did what he had to do, she would never be able to look at him the same. Obi-Wan could have helped Anakin, somehow, Padme would always think. But as Yoda was going over all this, Padme said nothing. There was no time for grief, not when they had to save the Republic and the remaining Jedi from execution. Senator Padme Amidala knew this. And as the discussions went on, Yoda would go over what they needed to do next. The Grand Master would make it clear that he and Obi-Wan wouldn't be able to do anything further without the help of Bail and Padme. The Emperor, gone he is, but the Empire too, we must destroy, Yoda would say. Hearing this, Bail would follow his bro. Master Yoda, destroying an empire built on a foundation of lies and carefully manufactured loyalties, that's a task far grander than simply defeating a man, even one as dangerous as Palpatine. 
the senator of Alderaan said in a defeated tone. But hearing this, Batman would speak up. You're right, Bale, but to do nothing is no option either. As long as these clones act on Palpatine's twisted command, every moment, more Jedi perish. There has to be a way to counter, to repeal it. We have friends in the Senate, allies who have been silenced by fear and manipulation. But with Palpatine gone, now is the time to rekindle the light of democracy, to show them they're not alone. We can't just simply stand on and watch as the Republic and the Jedi Order are killed. Bale, after listening to all this, while still unsure of their future, agreed that they needed to stop the purge of the Jedi and that it was their priority. As for how to do it, we need to get back to Coruscant immediately. It is only by convincing the Senate that the Jedi weren't guilty that we can stop this massacre, Bale said. He then continued, even if what Master Windu and Master Yoda did was actually treason, it would still be unjust and wrong for the entire Order to be punished for it. We will do everything we can. If not called off, we will at least convince the Senate to halt Order 66 until an investigation is done into the matter, Bell Organa said. As for Padme, she too agreed. With Palpatine gone, we do stand a chance at this, she said. And Master Yoda, listening to all this, added the following. Go before the Senate, I will. Convince them, I will, that I committed treason. My failure at this was, Yoda would say, ready to take all the blame for himself and save the Order. But Bail or Gato Halloran would tell Yoda that it won't be necessary, and that it is very likely that the remaining Jedi can be saved without Yoda sacrificing himself. The reason Bail would say this is because he knows that if Yoda were to be discovered by the Empire at this point, he would be executed without even a trial, and that wouldn't really help anyone. Once things in the Senate calm down, Yoda's testimony would be instrumental in clearing the Jedi's name. Bale knew this, so Yoda sacrificing himself now was pointless. Also, another reason was that Bale believed Yoda would be crucial in rebuilding the Jedi Order if Palpatine's lies are exposed. So basically, among other things, Bale didn't want the hope of the Jedi's return to be destroyed. And after much convincing, Yoda would also see the logic in Bale's argument. And so, the discussions between Bale, Padme, and Yoda would go on for a little longer, but ultimately, Bale and Padme would soon make their way over to Coruscant. And also, Luke and Leia, with Padme being alive, wouldn't have to be separated, but they wouldn't be sent to Coruscant with their mother. Instead, Luke and Leia, at least for the time being, would be sent to Naboo, to Padme's family. Padme does this because, essentially, she doesn't have time for Luke and Leia, not with everything going on in the Empire. As for Yoda, he would stay on Polis Massa, at least for the time being, until Palpatine's true nature is exposed, or until an investigation is ordered into the matter. The reason for this, apart from Yoda being the Grand Master of the Jedi Order, is that two royal guards and Massa Mera saw Yoda walk in to kill Palpatine, so Yoda had to stay hidden. And as for Obi-Wan, he too was present during all this, but other than listen, he did not say much, and this was due to Obi-Wan's mind still showing him the figure of Anakin Skywalker burning alive. Yoda, who had sensed this turmoil within Obi-Wan, would talk to him about it once Padme and Bale had... Bale's departed. Turning his eyes towards Obi-Wan, Yoda spoke. Your fault, it was not, Obi-Wan. The choice a young Skywalker made, his own, they were. Blame yourself, you should not. The will of the Force, it was. No one could have altered young Skywalker's fate, Yoda said. Hearing this, Obi-Wan didn't know what to say. The unbelieving he failed Anakin, what pained Obi-Wan equally as much was knowing that Anakin, who he saw as a brother, was now gone. So side note, Obi-Wan and Yoda would be able to sense that Anakin Skywalker was dead, because they would have felt Anakin's presence in the cosmic force. But Obi-Wan did not discuss any of this with Yoda, simply telling Grandmaster Yoda that he is right, and that he, Obi-Wan, would meditate on his feelings. And so that discussion would end, and Obi-Wan and Yoda would remain on Paul's Masa as Padme and Bale tried to clear the Jedi's name in the Senate. So in the days, weeks, months, years, decades, and even centuries that followed, many things happened in the galaxy. Let's go over them. So soon after arriving back on Coruscant, Padme and Bale found the Senate in chaos. The Emperor was dead, and it was Master Yoda who did it. There was proof of this. This was all anyone was talking about. They had quite a task ahead, Bale and Padme realized after seeing all this. And so, the first thing that the two did was gather their allies and tell them the truth. And in this discussion, Padme, Bale, and the likes of Mon Mothma all eventually concluded that the Senate was not going to believe that Palpatine was behind the Clone Wars. So they decided that, for the time being, the best course of action was to convince the Senate that the entirety of the Jedi Order shouldn't be punished for the treason of a few masters. And in this effort, Bale, Padme, and Mon Mothma too spoke with many senators, and eventually, after gaining sufficient 
support brought up the topic in the Senate. Their main argument was that the thousands of Jedi that were killed for the actions of a few masters were not guilty, and that the Empire, being in the state it was in, could use all the help that it could get, even from the Jedi, and that expending resources to hunt down the remaining Jedi across the galaxy was a waste of finances and an effort that could be directed towards helping those in need. There would be many voices that opposed this idea, with some senators even believing that the Jedi are all mind controlled by the Force and that it was the Force that tried to commit treason, not the individual Jedi. But eventually, after a lot of explaining and after a lot of time, the dissenting voices dissipated slowly, and Order 66 was ordered to be called off by the new Emperor who was elected. This was strange because Emperors are not usually elected, but it was a strange time for the galaxy. Anyways, following this, the hunt of the Jedi stopped, and the remaining Jedi, who numbered in just a few hundreds, were allowed to return, train new Jedi, and serve the Empire, but not as independently as they did before. The Jedi, who returned, would now be serving under the command of the Imperial Army, which was fully composed of the clones at this point in the timeline. So even though most of the Senate agreed that the purge of the Jedi should stop, they did still want someone to oversee the Jedi, which is why the Jedi were now under the control of the Republic or Imperial Army. Also at this point, Obi-Wan would choose to return to Coruscant from Polis Massa. The reason for this was because the purge had ended and Jedi were in short supply and the order had to be rebuilt. And there was nothing else for Obi-Wan to do in this timeline because he's not in charge of Luke here. And so, because of all that, Obi-Wan came back to the temple on Coruscant and became a Jedi once more. As for Master Yoda, however, he would not return until the Imperial Senate was convinced that Palpatine was secretly Darth Sidious, the man who orchestrated the Clone Wars. This would have taken time, but evidence for Palpatine's true nature came after Count Dooku's castle on Sereno was raided by Imperial forces, where they found recordings of hollow transmissions between Dooku and Palpatine which is when the Senate began to believe that maybe the Jedi were in the traitors after all, and that maybe the man who reorganized the Galactic Republic into the Empire didn't love democracy as much as he said. And it was only at this point, with the Senate beginning to see Palpatine's true side, that Yoda came out of hiding, as per Bail Organa's advice, and testified before the Senate, telling them everything about the clone troopers, their inhibitor chips, Order 66, the Sith, and how Palpatine did everything he did to destroy the Jedi and take over the Republic the result of a millennia-long plan by the Sith. Now, a good majority of the Senate was still not sold on Palpatine being guilty, but it was at this point that Mao Meta, the vice chair during Palpatine's period as Chancellor, became suspicious. And upon being interrogated by the Jedi using Force techniques, Meta revealed all he knew. And what he knew was a lot. In fact, Mao Meta was one of the few beings outside of Darth Plagueis who knew of Palpatine's dual identity. And so, with Mao Meta's help, the Jedi would finally be able to clear their name, and the Empire, which by this point had been re-reorganized into the New Republic, would grant the Jedi all the rights they had before. They would be given their independence back and would be brought about the control of the New Republic army. Also, following this, all the clones would have their inhibitor chips removed, their further creation would be ceased, and many would start seeing the clones as traitors, even though they were literally programmed to do what they did but few would see the logic in this. Most would simply see the clones as scum for doing something they had no choice but to do. But when all was said and done, the Jedi Order was reborn as the new Jedi Order, who would be much more vigilant than their predecessors. As for Padme, she would still surrender Luke and Leia to the Jedi after the temple was reopened. Because at this point in her life, with Anakin gone, Padme would direct all her focus towards her work and would come to believe that her children would be better off being raised as Jedi. As for what happened to Anakin, she would eventually blame all that on Palpatine and not on the Jedi Order. And she would also come to believe that most of Anakin's problems happened because he was trained far too old into his life. And because of all that, Padme would give Luke and Leia to the Jedi and she will live the rest of her life focusing on nothing other than her work as a politician. And one day, like all people, she too would die without ever telling Luke and Leia that she was their mother, which is something that Obi-Wan and Yoda would never tell them either, cheering them forming attachments. So side note, in this timeline, the remaining Jedi, mainly Yoda and Obi-Wan, would believe that Anakin's attachment to Padme is what caused his downfall. Anakin and Padme's relationship was pretty much an open secret that Obi-Wan especially knew about but ignored. So at this point, Obi-Wan and Yoda would consider ignoring Anakin's attachment to Padme a mistake 
And as a result, so as to not repeat these mistakes, the new Jedi Order under Yoda and Obi-Wan would make their rules in this regard much more strict. Anyways, as for Luke and Leia's life, being the children of Anakin Skywalker, they too would grow to be extremely powerful. They would be trained by many Jedi, including Yoda, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka Tano, who would have also retired by this point. Also, at this point, in the very early days of the new Jedi Order, Jedi initiates, which included Luke and Leia, would not be assigned individual masters. This was due to the simple reason that there were very few Jedi left for every single Padawan to be assigned a master. But that would change as the new Jedi Order grew in strength. Anyways, Luke and Leia would eventually become knights, then masters, and then council members. They would achieve much in their life and do much for the new Jedi Order, and would also play a significant part in guiding the new Jedi Order in a new direction. And then, they too would die. So, what happens now? Well, to explain that, let's go back a bit to before Luke and Leia died. So, in this timeline, due to how close the Jedi Order came to being completely destroyed, Master Yoda became slightly paranoid in his old age. The Jedi of the future would need to be prepared for anything, the Grand Master decided, and this sentiment of Yoda would cause some changes. For one, like I mentioned before, Yoda and the other masters would make the Jedi policy and attachments a lot harsher. So much so that in this new Jedi Order, anyone who showed the weakness of attachments would be immediately expelled from the Order. Yoda would also instruct the other masters and his students, including Luke and Leia when they got older, that this new Jedi Order should keep both itself and the New Republic protected from enemies, something the old Order didn't successfully do. What Yoda meant by this was that the new Jedi Order would need to make moves to attain a position of power within the New Republic, reminiscent of the period that existed 1000 years before the Clone Wars, when only Jedi could hold the position of Supreme Chancellor. Yoda would come to believe that it was then that the Jedi were the strongest and able to protect the Republic and themselves the best. In many ways, Yoda was right. After the Sith were completely destroyed a thousand years before the Clone Wars, the Jedi slowly let themselves become weak. Yoda would also warn that the new Jedi Order should always be on the lookout for the Dark and that they should destroy it whenever it tries to rise back up again, by any means necessary. So these would be the main teachings that an old, paranoid Yoda would pass on to his students. So because of Master Yoda's teachings, which the Jedi, including Luke and Leia, followed and then passed on to their successors, the new Jedi Order did become powerful, both in numbers and in political power within the New Republic due to many generations of careful planning. And because of all this, roughly 300 years after the New Order formed, a Jedi would again be elected into the position of the Supreme Chancellor. This would be the first time this has happened in 1,300 years. And then, another 200 years later, due to the Jedi winning many conflicts and even a few wars for the Republic, their power would increase further, with only Jedi being capable of holding the position of Supreme Chancellor now. And throughout these centuries, Yoda's final teachings had evolved in a way that Yoda may not have intended. The new Jedi Order that would exist 500 years after Yoda's death would be much more regressive and a little more power-hungry than Yoda had envisioned. But above all else, they had, over these years, made destroying the dark side their primary goal. In short, to follow the light and to keep the dark side at bay, these Jedi would be using some tactics better fit for a Sith, and eventually, a few of the Jedi of the Order would take note of this, and would accuse the High Council of the time of being hypocrites. And for this, all Jedi who spoke against the Council would be labeled as followers of the Dark Side, and would be marked for execution. Many of them would be executed, but some of them would be rescued in secret. And who would rescue them? Well, you see, after Palpatine was killed and the New Republic formed, the Separatist systems were forced to rejoin the New Republic, and left with no other choice, they did so. But their animosity towards the Republic, which had become the New Republic, remained. And over the centuries, this animosity only grew, which led to another, albeit smaller, war between the New Republic and the old Separatist systems, which was led by the planet Soreno, Count Dooku's own planet, which the old Separatist systems had come to consider as their unofficial capital world. Anyways, this war, which happened roughly 400 years after the Clone Wars, was easily won for the New Republic by the New Jedi Order. But although they lost the war, the Separatists learned a very valuable lesson, and this lesson was that as long as the Jedi existed, they could never be able to defeat the New Republic and escape from it. And this led to the Separatist systems, under the leadership of the Counts of Sereno, trying to train Force users of their own, but with little success. 
The problem they faced was that they had no good teachers to match those of the New Jedi Order on Coruscant. And as for the New Jedi Order, they of course knew that the Separatists were trying to create their own Jedi. But there was no legal means for the New Jedi Order or the New Republic to do anything about this, despite a Jedi being the Supreme Chancellor. At the end of the day, even though the Jedi had significant control of the New Republic, it wasn't a dictatorship. So they had no choice but to let Soreno carry out their experiments. But what the New Jedi did do was that they started preparing for if Soreno's false Jedi's were ever to become strong enough to pose a threat. Keep that in mind because that will come into play later on in the story. Anyways, it was during this period where Soreno was trying to build its own Jedi Order that word reads Soreno that a good number of fully trained Jedi had been marked for execution for turning to the dark side and opposing the Jedi High Council. When they heard of this, the only thing the Council of Sereno cared about was the opposing the High Council part, because they figured that if the Jedi were to be brought to Sereno, they could train Force users for the Separatists. So using all their resources, Sereno managed to rescue the Jedi from Coruscant. They did so in secret after causing an explosion in the prison where the Jedi were being kept in. This allowed for a distraction and a way to fake the deaths of the rescued Jedi. Anyways, after being brought to Sereno, these Jedi, who by this point hated the New Republic and the New Jedi Order that had ordered their execution, agreed to help the Separatists gain their freedom from the New Republic. And so, they began training for sensitives on Sereno. In secret, of course. Also, side note, these Jedi that had been brought to Sereno didn't try to turn to the dark side or anything because the reason they went against the High Council was because they believed the High Council were acting in ways opposed to the Jedi way of living. And that is the reason why these Jedi on Sereno named their order the True Jedi Order. Anyways, over many generations, Sereno's Jedi Order grew in power. The Jedi on Coruscant were aware of this, but again, due to the New Republic not being a Jedi dictatorship yet, the Coruscant Jedi could not just invade Sereno. But the Coruscant Jedi were not scared, and this is because, by this point, they had perfected a safety measure to be used against any Force users that might attack them or the New Republic. Keep that in mind. Anyways, more generations went by in this manner, with the true Jedi of Sereno and the new Jedi of Coruscant keeping a close eye on each other. But eventually, one particular Count of Sereno felt that the true Jedi were gaining a little too much power and this Count decided to do something about it. So, essentially, this Count, through his supporters and legal regulations, tried to wrestle away some of the true Jedi's power, but this backfired. The true Jedi attempted a coup of Sereno, and they succeeded. And as a result of this conflict, in the end, Sereno and the old Separatist systems it backed fell under the control of the true Jedi Order. However, the Separatist systems did not take this issue to the New Republic Senate. The reason for this was that many systems in the Separatist Alliance believed that the Council of Sereno were becoming weak and that the Jedi should have been in power. And beyond that, the Separatist Alliance, even at this point, trusted their true Jedi Order a lot more than the New Republic. And so, because of all this, the situation on Sereno with the true Jedi ended up being seen as an internal affair by the New Republic, a simple change in management. So, there was no war between these factions, yet. And then, as the years went on, the tensions between these two factions, the New Republic and the Separatist Alliance, which, by the way, is still part of the New Republic, officially at least, anyways, the point is, the tensions between these two factions, even though they were officially allies, grew hotter until roughly 1,000 years after the death of Palpatine and the creation of the New Republic, Potentials reached a breaking point. This happened when a senator representing a separatist system in the New Republic was attacked while returning from a diplomatic mission on a New Republic system, Alron to be specific. What had actually happened was that this separatist senator was mistaken for someone else. What led to this was a technical error by one of the New Republic technicians. But the simple mistake almost led to the senator getting shot out of the sky and dying, but the separatist true Jedi on board prevented it. So no one died, the only loss was to the separatist ship. But this is what ultimately led to the breaking point of tensions that had been building for centuries because the issue soon escalated, with the separatists arguing that it was actually an assassination attempt. The senate was so into disarray. The separatist systems began becoming more hostile to the new republic and calls for separatist independence started gaining traction. But what ultimately led to all out conflict was the actions of a single separatist extremist who had vast quantities of wealth. 
So what this individual did was hire some of the galaxy's best bounty hunters, and then after a long while of planning, the Separatist and his bounty hunters managed to plant charges within the Republic Senate. And then, once the Senate was in session, they set off these charges, taking the lives of pretty much everyone inside. As for the safety of the Separatist Senators, because of the tensions, they had elected to not participate in the Republic Senate. So, all those who died from the explosion were senators from the New Republic systems. And as for the reason this Separatist carried out the attack was because he believed that war between the Separatists and the New Republic was inevitable. And that the sooner it happened, the better. And so, this incident ultimately led to all-out war between the Separatists and the New Republic, a thousand years after the last one. However, unlike in the last war, there were no clone troopers or droid armies in this war. Instead, it was the New Republic Jedi and the true Jedi of Sereno who were fighting this war. And it is now, with the galaxy at war again, that the New Republic Jedi, their High Council, decides to use the secret weapon that they had designed for if the true Jedi or Sith ever attacked. The existence of this weapon was only known to the High Council. And as for what this weapon did, well, this weapon was a virus that could sever a being's connection to the Force, and the New Republic Jedi had not come up with this themselves. Instead, they had come across research into this virus from a being by the name of Rugus Gnome, who was a bit scientist. And as for why this being, Rugus Gnome, designed the virus? Well, Rugus Gnome was a Sith named Darth Tenebrous, the master to Darth Plagueis, who was Palpatine's master. So side note, it is detailed in the Plagueis novel that Darth Tenebrous and his master, who was an unnamed Twi'lek, tried to destroy the Jedi by generating a virus that would sever their connection to the Force. But Darth Tenebrous was not successful in that effort, which is something that Plagueis notes in the novel. Anyways, in this timeline, over the many years after their rebirth, the new Jedi Order, as per Yoda's teachings, made protecting themselves against the dark side a priority. And years after Yoda's death, these Jedi, after researching the rule of two Sith, who had almost destroyed them, came across Darth Tenebrous' work. And when they found out about the virus Tenebrous was working on, the new Jedi decided to keep the research and further Tenebrous' research. Their goal was to create a deterrent for if the Sith ever came back. And this goal later evolved into any Force user that might go against them. They'd only ever use it for good, those Jedi told themselves. But the Sith never came back. Instead, the weapon was unleashed on the Separatist true Jedi when the war broke out. And it worked. All those affected lost their connection to the Force. Many Republic Jedi were also affected, but they had devised a cure over the years, so it was only the Separatists that were affected. And the war seemed like it would reach a quick end, and it did. The Republic won. But the price of that victory, as they soon found out, was huge. You see, the virus, which the Jedi had created as a failsafe against any Force users who opposed them, turned into an unparalleled disaster. Initially, it worked as intended, severing the Separatist Jedi's connection to the Force. This was expected of the virus, but its mutation was not just unforeseen, it was catastrophic. The Republic Jedi, in their pursuit to defeat the Separatist Jedi, it inadvertently unleashed a plague far deadlier than anything any Sith could ever have conjured. The mutation of the virus occurred due to a fundamental oversight, which was the virus's interaction with the diverse genetic makeup of the galaxy's countless species. While the Jedi had tested the virus on small scales, these trials were not comprehensive enough to predict the virus's behavior out in the open, which in this context was the vast genetic pool of the entire galaxy. So what happened was that the virus, designed to target only those connected to the Force, evolved beyond the Republic Jedi's control, its lethal efficiency magnified by the diverse genetic landscape it encountered. As the virus spread, it began to affect the fundamental biological processes of countless species. Respiratory failures, neural degradation, and systematic organ failure became rampant. Symptoms of a being's life force unraveling without the Force's sustaining presence. The Republic Jedi's attempt to engineer a cure was a race against an accelerating doom. The cure they had prepared was no longer functioning due to the mutations that the virus had undergone. But soon enough, laboratories that had once stood as beacons of hope and innovation in the galaxy turned into tombs, their researchers succumbing to the very plague they sought to combat. The virus, in its relentless mutation, outpaced their every effort, rendering their cure obsolete before it could ever be deployed. 
Galactic civilization crumbled as the virus spread to every corner of the galaxy and society. Capitals of commerce and culture became ghost towns, their once bustling streets now silent, except for the howling of winds through empty market squires and abandoned homes. Starships drifted lifelessly in space, their crews overcome by the plague, their journeys ending not with exploration or trade, but with the cold embrace of the void. As for the survivors of the Jedi Plague, as it came to be known, less than 5% of the galactic population possessed the rare mutation that saved them from being infected by the virus. Isolated on planets or in small enclaves, they faced the daunting task of forging a future from the ruins of a galaxy that had lost not just its population, but its soul as well. The Force, once a universal language connecting all life, was now a distant memory, a legend from a bygone era whispered among the survivors. And also, in the wake of this apocalypse, a few Jedi did survive. These were of course Jedi who had immunity to the virus, but they were very few in number. And these Jedi were vilified by the other survivors. They were seen not as protectors, but as harbingers of the end. The remnants of their once glorious order was scattered, forced into hiding or succumbing to the overwhelming guilt of their role in this tragedy. The legacy of the Jedi, once a proud and noble institution, was now irrevocably tarnished, associated forever with the greatest genocide that the galaxy had ever witnessed, a tragedy that would have made Darth Vitiate proud. And so in the end, as the planet slain ruin and civilization turned to dust, the galaxy became a vast mausoleum, a testament to the dangers of wielding power without wisdom. In this new era of silence and shadow, the survivors faced the monumental task of rebuilding not just their roles, but their faith in the possibility of a future. A future that remained extremely uncertain. So in the end, Palpatine's death led to the death of trillions in this timeline. Anyways, that is it for this video. If you enjoyed and if you feel like supporting the channel, do check out my Patreon where for $1 or more a month you can get early access to videos and some exclusive content. Goodbye and stay hydrated.